So, so far we've gone through and we've looked at vectorization and caches and threading. And we've seen some tools that might help you to actually develop threaded codes by doing, helping to do scoping and other things that we need if we want to be able to develop our codes effectively. Um, we're probably going to get through today quicker than on the timetable. One of the things we always get back from feedback forms and so on is that there's never enough time to finish the exercises and so on. So we want to make sure there's plenty of time for those exercises that you haven't finished later on in the day you'll be able to get on with. Today we're going to have a quick look at some of the more important things when you've got your code um, to make sure that you can get some good performance out of it. We'll just look at the bugs briefly, the, just mention briefly what those bug types are. Um, and then we'll move on to performance issues. Um, so firstly, just to say what the most common types of bug are. Um, the first one would be incorrect scoping. So if you declare your variable shared, private, and so on incorrectly, you're going to get a problem. Normally, these problems are quite repeatable and so on. You'll see them all the time. Um, and so therefore, you can see that you've got a problem. Because we're doing this incrementally normally, we go through and we add an extra piece of parallelism to a code rather than just parallelizing huge sections, you know, thousands of lines at once before running and checking, you should be able to see if you've got a scoping problem as you're incrementally changing your code. So that may be one that you can easily spot. But be, be aware that when you're using tools such as Reveal, Intel Advisor, whatever it happens to be, particularly Reveal is the one we've shown, then that you check that actually when it says that something should be private, shared, whatever it happens to be, that it's actually you yourself believe that to be the case and understand why it's the case. So when we have a look at an exercise or two later, I've typically left out the parallel line so you can just fill in the scoping as well just to get, make sure you're doing it correctly. Um, so another bug that you sometimes see is when you change your algorithm from serial code, particularly if you're doing something with conditional compilation. So in Fortran, that's exclamation mark dollar. Um, as I said, I think it's a little ugly, but um, with C, it would be if def open MP. You may put some code in there. Oh, yes, this is just something I need for my code, but it may actually change the way that the code, the algorithm works. Also be aware that sometimes you get threaded numerical libraries you've, you've brought in from elsewhere, and there may be some slight differences in results. Occasionally, there's a bug, and there's actually a very different result, and then tell us or tell your vendor that you think that there's a problem. But oftentimes, um, it's just that there's some ordering, different ordering of the way that the operations are carried out, and it will give you some slight numerical difference. And that's like when we saw on the first day we were looking at um, the very contrived and simple example, and we had double precision and single precision, and people were saying the single precision results in, uh, um, with vectorization were different. It's a similar sort of thing where threading, you may get things in a different order. The vectorization was also just doing things in a different order and giving a different result. Um, that's not necessarily a bug, it's just a different number. Ah, okay, we're getting closer to the full complement. Okay, um, now one thing that you probably won't see much of in an OpenMP code, unless you go out of your way to uh, put this in and therefore potentially introduce your own bugs, is deadlocks introduced from locking. That is, that you would typically use the runtime library routine um, you can see this from man pages or from the OpenMP standard in particular. You can see the, the library routine to say, okay, I want a lock. Grab a lock, create one, grab it for a particular thread, and then I'll release it at some point. And that lock will be there so that nobody else can get in. That could give you problems. In particular, it can give you problems with deadlock. This is not something you'd normally do in OpenMP. We haven't mentioned it here. We're not going to look at it here because it's something that you have to have a particular example you're interested in to do that way. But for other things, particularly pthreads, pthreads relies on it all the time. So effectively, OpenMP is relying on it all the time. It's just it's hidden from us. And this is where we have the mutex variables, conditioned variables. Mutex stands for mutual exclusion. Only one thread can have this at a time. If one of them grabs a lock and can't release it or doesn't release it, nobody else can move forward, you get deadlock. 
We don't need to worry about it too much, but if you go into a different threading model, be aware that that could be a problem. The one that's the real most important one for us, though, is a race condition. So this was mentioned by Jean-Guillaume yesterday, um, and there's one of the examples that you can use the debugging tool for to look at a race condition. Uh, it's the most common type of bug we get in threaded code. It's the most difficult to solve bug in threaded code. It's not restricted to OpenMP. This is in all threaded code. And it's, it's really bad when these things happen because sometimes you don't see them Sometimes you might see them for many minutes. Sometimes you might see them for hours and so on. Uh, but they're there, sitting in the background. And sometimes they'll just give you completely different results each time. So what on earth is a race condition? So a race condition occurs when you've got two threads, or more threads, um, all wanting to update the same piece of data. So. It's related to what we'll look at in a second with, with cache coherency and thrashing and so on, but this time it's dangerous rather than a performance hit. And it's concerned with data when you load it into a processor register. Okay, once this data's in a register, nobody else can see it. Cache coherency is something where everybody is aware of everybody else's cache. If somebody else updates their cache, then I get a message to say my data is bad in my cache and therefore I should go and update it. When something's in a register, it's hidden from view. It's your own private little stash put in your wallet. Nobody else knows how many notes you've got there. But if you're at the cash point, they can see the notes coming out and so on. So this is um, rather bad. Now, one of the things about this is when we get a race condition, because we're mentioning here two threads, and we'll just show, go through the example, the more threads you have, the, the better chance you will have of, of catching a race condition, because there's more people racing for it. So if we take an example here, both threads, two threads going after a copy of a variable. So on the right-hand side, we will have what the, uh, the actual calculation taking place is as we go down in this race condition. Um, so we've got a variable in memory. Uh, its value is 2. It's actually led and loaded into cache by each one, but it's still effectively, as far as we're concerned, now just memory. They load it into a register. Thread over here cannot see the register over here. So the first of these two threads is now in its register. It adds two to its copy. Okay, so it's now added two, and we've got four over here. Then the second thread comes along, and it wants to add three to its copy. It doesn't know that the one over here has updated it. It can't see it. It's in a register. So the actual calculation we've currently got taking place is we added two, we added three. So we should be seeing seven as the answer in this case. The first thread writes back its copy from a register. It didn't know that the other one had done anything with it. It was in a register. It didn't see it. It didn't update the cache. It didn't update the memory. So it puts its copy back. And then where the real problem then occurs is the second thread, not knowing that this has now been updated, not caring, goes and writes its late data back into the register. So we have five in the actual memory location, but the result should have been seven. We added two and we added three. Unfortunately, these two threads, totally independent of each other, not realizing what the other's done, have added their things separately and we've got the result is five. Quite easily, that could have been, for example, four. If Second thread was the first one to write its data back, so down here it would have written five, and then the first thread was to write its data back, we get four. So there's a variety of different ways where the race condition could show itself up. Or well, the other way it would happen is that actually this one read its, its data in, updated it before the second one even got there. That's what a race condition's about. The two things are racing for the data. Now, the more... If this just happened to be eight threads, each wanting to add a piece of uh, information to a particular memory location, as you can guess, we'd have a much better chance of seeing the race condition because there's more possibility for things to go wrong. So sometimes you might, see, you might think you may have a race condition. If you can up the thread count, you may actually be able to expose it quicker. But this is the most common type of bug, the most difficult to track down because it's some, it, oftentimes it doesn't exist. It, 
you don't see it at all. After all, if these things were normally out by several nanoseconds or whatever, they're never really clashing this piece of the code. You don't see it, and it's only when they're actually both trying the same piece of code you get a problem. How do we get around this? This is where you have to protect certain updates by atomic or critical directives, if you think there's a risk of a race condition. That is, if you're updating a shared variable, and it's a real shared variable, the actual memory location is a shared variable, as opposed to it's a shared array. I'll look after a section over here, you look after a section over there, but the actual memory locations are distinct. We don't then worry about it. But if we've got something like um, a particular location that may be a value of a sum or something similar, then that's when we have, have problems with reduction operations and so on. But that's about bugs, but what about performance? Because performance, after all, is also, if you get poor performance, that's a bug, all right? We don't want poor performance. So with OpenMP, it looks quite simple because we just go in and we just start adding directives and then we can hopefully get some speed up and so on. And it's not like anybody who's been developing an MPI code or any other distributed memory approach where because now everything's in distributed memory, you can't see anybody else's memory, you have to do the whole thing at once, right? Everything has to be done at once. You can't go along piecemeal and say, oh, well, I'll, I'll do this set of loops MPI and then leave the rest alone. It's an all or nothing approach. OpenMP, we do it incrementally. We go in, we find, we use a tool such as Reveal to say, where is the most expensive pieces of the code? And then we'll go in and we'll attack those pieces of the code, run it again, and then we can add the next and next and next until we've, we've got something that we're happy with. So we can, open, we can do this incrementally in order to get some speed up. But if you just add directives, then the problem is you're not really necessarily just thinking as deeply as you would have to if you did the whole code thing. Um, and that means that you therefore not, won't necessarily get the good, same level of performance. And there are many issues that we need to consider for performance. So I'm going to go through a few here and then Ben will talk about the, the one that we tend to see much more of as a performance problem, which is to do with uh, numer and affinity effects. Um, and they're normally more of a problem on our architectures of today because they're not necessarily as obvious as some of the ones we'll just look at here. So the number one performance killer is our old friend Amdahl's law. Okay, the fact that you're, you can do this incrementally means at some point you decide to stop typically doing your parallelism. Well, depends on how many threads you want to run and how many cores you want to run on as to whether or not that's actually then going to be a killer for you. Right? We don't expect to scale forever. But here's the typical graph that we get. You've seen this, I'm sure, many times before. You really have to get this in as, a, as the point. If you don't finish the job, you're going to suffer. So if you do something like 90% uh, of parallelism and you only want to run on four cores, that's not really a problem, right? You're going to get a good bit of speed up out of that. You'll be getting three point something speed up. Um, if you then move up to, say, 95% of parallelism for eight threads, then eight threads here on 95% parallel is going, is going to give you six or seven times speed up. But the nodes on Monte Rosa are 32 cores. And if you, apart from the fact that you really wouldn't want to do this for numerous affinity effects on that machine, okay, and people who have looked at this know that the machine does not work well with NUMA. But if you were in a position to use 32 cores, and that's highly likely in the future with the, uh, the particular um, architectures we're moving forward to, then you've really, really got to push high 99.5% of your code running in parallel if you actually want to be able to get good scaling. Otherwise, 95% now doesn't really get you very far. It's going to be less than half of the, the potential performance of the node because you're sitting in those serial sections all the time. So Amdahl's law is our number one performance killer as we move forward into the future because it just means we have to do more and more parallelism out of our applications where we wouldn't have bothered with it before. Okay, that one is one I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but it just really needs to be said as we move into the massively multi-core era, era, as we'll hear from about the Xeon Phi. Uh, load balance. So 
uh, a sh convoy of ships can only go as fast as its slowest ship, right? In, in open MP terms, this means the speed of a threaded region is limited to the last thread to reach synchronization point. Now, we have to synchronize from time to time uh, to make sure all the data is synchronized and everyone's, every thread understands the same view of memory, etc. Everybody's finished their job. Um, there was actually, just a, a side issue, there was um, a few years ago I was working in uh, a, a university where there was a military college at the side and somebody was saying, this is probably a complete myth but I like the story anyway, that somebody in Canada there was a, a, a simulation that people had written their own little simulation of their convoy and how it would attack somebody else and then it would get away and so on. And one of these was kept winning and they realized that somebody put in uh, the, the code to say, when you've finished a raid, turn around and sink any of your ships that were damaged. And then they could keep moving faster. Probably a complete myth, but I like the idea. So you can only go as fast as you get to a synchronization point. Um, so if there's a, a load imbalance in one of your threaded regions, then that's going to cause you a problem. Okay, so we have ways of getting around this. That's one of the reasons why we have these dynamical guided schedules that we mentioned. Okay, if, things, if you really don't understand how things are going to be going for a particular iteration of a loop, for example, there may be more work or less work. Let's take, for example, that we're working on something like a weather or a climate code or whatever. You may go down somewhere and suddenly find precipitation, cloud cover, may increase the amount of work in atmospheric chemistry. Similarly, you may be on the, the sunny side of the planet and there's lots of chemistry going on, but on, on other threads are doing less work. Be able to use dynamic or guided may be able to help you get a better load balance. But typically as well, you may also be able to get away with the no wait clause in your for do directives to be able to say, don't synchronize as often if I can get away with this. It's very important only if you can get away with that. Um, so the next thing I'm not going to really deal with, just to say what a NUMA node is and what cache coherence is about, these things are going to be dealt with in a separate presentation by Ben. But typically, what we have on the machines that you see here um, are machines which have multi-core processors and they're connected together by hypertransport QPI on the x86 world with a local memory and for a particular core, what it would see as a remote memory. Now, remember, we mentioned that there are some architectures this wouldn't affect you with. And those are things like a Blue Gene Q machine or a Fujitsu K machine or not necessarily machines that you'll typically have access to. Most of the nodes you will see will be multi-core, multi-socket or, or at least multi-die nodes. And that's certainly the case with the machines that we've got uh, here with Pilatus and Rosa and Turdy. And Rosa being particularly bad, as you'll see. Um, but the point here is that this processor can access this same memory over here. It's just that it's slowing, slower. It's non-uniform access. It sees it as a, it's got that longer latency. And we saw that as the very first thing we did, which is to go on these machines and see this little uh, uh, matrix of latencies to remote memory. But we also have cache coherence. Cache coherence means that if one of these cores here has a piece of the memory, a record of the memory, because it's a copy, and this one has a copy, if this one updates it, then we know we've got to update ours. The, the memory subsystem will say, stop what you're doing, that's a dirty copy of memory. If it's gone into a register, it's too late. But if there's something that's dirty, then the cache coherency protocols will say, you have to go back to memory next time, you can't just use what's in your cache. So the cache coherence says the caches are local copies of that global memory. So we can, we can look at whether or not something's a local memory or a remote memory. And if we're in separate processes as opposed to separate threads, remember, we don't actually have access to the other person's memory, the other processor's memory. So we don't have to worry about any of this cache coherency. No one else will have a copy of the memory normally. Um, 
For OpenMP codes, though, where we have multiple threads showing the same address space, we might have several of these threads who've loaded one of those cache lines in and want to do some updating of it. So before accessing that memory from the core to put into a register, um, a processor has to check the cache and find out whether or not that cache line has been updated by somebody else. Um, if it has been updated by somebody else, when it tries to read it from the cache line, it will see that the, the cache line is flagged as dirty and I need a fresh copy and it will go out and get it. You don't have to worry about this from the point of view of having to do any work. This is simply going to, it's going to slow you down if you have to go to main memory rather than reuse your cache. Now, just because we can see cache coherency, just because if something's been updated by somebody else, then we can actually know that we've got to go and get a new copy of data, doesn't mean that we've got rid of a problem. It just, that's a performance issue, not a, bu a bug issue. The bug issue we've already just seen is a race condition. Once something goes into a process of register, it doesn't matter if somebody else is updating it or not, it's too late. I've already got my copy and I'm going to keep it and I'm going to update it. There are certain things where people are now trying to get around it, th these issues, not so much for race conditions, but for performance as well, um, to do with something called transactional memory, which is coming into quite a few of our processes these days, but we won't look at that here. So how does cache coherence work upon multiple cores? So here we have an example. We have two CPUs. They've only got one level of cache here. Makes it easier to look at. Uh, they take a copy of the same data from memory. So this is, looks a bit like the race condition example, but we're not now loading into a register which is hidden from other people. This cache is globally visible by the cache coherency protocol to the other processes cache. It knows about it. So both of these have taken a copy of something from memory. Now one of them wants to write to this data. The local copy is going to be affected. We don't write back to main memory at this point. We might, depending on our cache hierarchy, update other levels of cache, but we're not going to affect the main memory. Otherwise, there's no point having the cache in the first place. Because the reason for having the fast cache is to avoid those memory accesses. So what happens now? On a cache coherent system, I want to update this piece of memory. The first thing I have to do is actually make sure the other person knows that uh, bef before I do any updating effectively, don't update yours. I'm about to make this a dirty cache line. So this invalidates the cache line over here, says your version is now going to be old, out of date. You need to get a fresh copy. And then I can update my data. So now that I've invalidated over here, I am now free to update the data. And the other person knows that if they've got a, they want to do something now, they have to get a fresh copy. Similarly, if they do the update, I will now be informed I've got an invalid copy. I have to go back. OK. So that's cache coherency. Now, now comes our big second big performance thing, pretty much after Numa and Affinity. This is something you definitely want to avoid. It's called cache trashing, false sharing, cache trashing, a number of different phrases for it. So the cache coherency protocols are going to update things based on cache lines. So we don't base anything on individual items. We do things on cache lines. So we've got two threads here that want to access completely different data, but on the same cache line. Okay, so this is um, a cache line that, um, for example, these are double precision numbers, and this is a 32-byte cache line. We saw a 64-byte cache line. So processor one wants to update in, I'll, because you're the majority of you are C and C++, uh, items zero and two in the array, and this one, one and three. Okay? But they don't want to update the same thing, so there's not going to be any of our problems to do with race condition. So the first one writes to its cache line. Okay. But as it does so, it has to also say PROC2's cache line is invalid. You have to go back to main memory, get a fresh copy, or get a fresh copy from me, however the memory hierarchy is going to work, whether it's directly from the cache or I have to write back. Okay. 
Now PROC2 wants to reload the data, and it wants to write the data, but at the same time it has to tell PROC1 that its cache line is invalid. Okay. But I want to update item number three. So I've now got to go and do a reload, and again, write my data at the same time, telling PROC2 that its cache line is now invalid again. And then this carries on, as you can say. see. If I need to go back to that, only if I need to go back to this do I then need to reload again. So that means that rather than just sitting there with cache, we have to keep going backwards and forwards to memory. Now, I loaded this cache line in once. Why wasn't that good enough? I've got to reload it and reload it and reload it. This is a lot of memory traffic. It's also a huge latency hit every time I'm effectively going back to main memory. My cache is useless. The best case that you get, therefore, is the serialization of work because all that happens is I'm trying to, load, as I'm trying to load my cache here, what's more likely is PROC3 writes, say PROC1 writes to that, that element there again. And even as the cache line's being loaded, it's being told, uh, you need to get it again because <laughs> I've updated it. And this one just actually has to wait until it's finished all its updates here before it can actually get the cache line. That's the best case scenario. Same thing, just different words for it. Um, it's one of those things where there's multiple terminologies. It can be a bit confusing. So the best case is, for, is uh, serialization. In the worst case, you will see a slowdown of your parallel code compared to the serial version. And that is the case that like, we see here, where both of the, of the threads are trying to update the memory, and they keep destroying each other's memory. So how do we avoid this false sharing? Well, we have to understand when we actually would actually get false sharing in the first place. So it's when multiple threads want to write to the same cache line. Um, the other aspect of this is that there has to be some temporal locality about these updates. If one of them wants to update some cache, uh, cache line, and then the other one, it's several, it's many clock cycles later, wants to update it, then you're not going to get the overlapping effect. This one will get all its updates out of the way, and it just means you've got to reload the once. And that's not too much of a problem. But we'd still rather avoid such a thing. The use of private copies of data cannot lead to false sharing, because if it's my private data, nobody else is seeing it. It's like having a separate process. So that's a good way of getting out around things if you can somehow form your algorithm to use private data. If data is more than a cache line away, again, not a problem. So if we can, some, we, one way you may be able to do this, if you find that there's some piece of data and it's a relatively small amount that you need to share the cache lines for, then you may want to put a, a buffer in between every element. For example, by having a second dimension in an array or just by multiplying by eight the, or 16 or whatever it happens to be, the, uh, the distance between adjacent elements. And then they'll all be on separate cache lines and we won't care. We will, of course, now be loading more data. We load in an entire cache line anyway, but we will get around the cache thrashing effect. And data that is only read but not written can't lead to false sharing because nobody else is updating it and telling you you're invalid. You can keep Two, two copies of the data in two separate threads if they're read-only is not a problem. So that was cache thrashing, and that's one of the effects that you can see that can really slow down your code. Some of the others that tend to actually be less of an issue these days, uh, but are still there, um, are thread creation overhead. Synchronization is always a, a problem, but thread creation overhead is not as much of a problem as it was, say, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and so on. And that is because now we don't tend to actually recreate threads and destroy threads when we go through a code, when we enter and leave parallel regions. They're just told to go to sleep. So therefore, the powering up of the new threads is less of an issue. But we do have synchronization issues still. So in theory, we would destroy, but most implementations are just doing a sleep. Um, but we do have these barriers, and these barriers can, uh, will certainly occur at the end of every parallel region because we've got to send the others to sleep and make sure everything's synchronized, and we want to avoid that. 
So if we stay within a parallel region, then we can just create, do work sharing constructs, etc., etc., or the bits that we want to do in serial, we can put around a master or a single, single preferably with no weight if we can get away with it. Um, then the parallel region stays alive and we don't have to do so much synchronization. One of the other things that we may want to do actually is duplicating work if the, just doing it on the master is not sufficient. We don't normally do that on OpenMP. That's more of a distributed memory thing. In distributed memory codes, in MPI codes, then what you may do is if everybody needs to work out some sort of, uh, it may be a local residual or something, um, you may all do it because you're not going to affect anyone else. With OpenMP codes, we tend to have a master region around so that only one person would do something. Um, for best performance, though, try to use no weight on every, the end of every do or for loop if you can get away with it. In other words, if the next loop or if the next piece of work you're going to do doesn't require the results of the previous one, try and defer a barrier as far as you can. It doesn't have to be a real barrier. It could be another synchronization point. For example, another for loop or another do loop is coming up where you would have to wait at the end of that. Put a no weight in the one that you don't need to worry about and let the synchronizations become less frequent. This will also help you because synchronizations can slow you down. Another thing to be aware of is to be careful what you ask for when you actually put in an OpenMP directive. If you put in an OpenMP directive on a loop, you're telling the compiler, I want you to uh, parallelize that loop. Not the following loop, not the one to, nested a little bit further down, but that loop. And I do want you to parallelize it. I do want you to put threads in there. It's important that the compiler understands that it has to parallelize certain loops because you may be laying your data out, as you'll understand later, in terms of trying to get affinity mappings where you want a certain thread to be doing a certain set of iterations on a certain piece of data because you know that data is local. And if they did it on different threads, it'll be on the remote node's memory. Okay, it's still shared memory, but it'd be further away. The compiler needs to be aware of this. So it would, sometimes you can inhibit some loop transformations uh, or even vectorization in, in the worst cases. And sometimes, therefore, you, should, you may want to have a look at a compiler report and see what the compiler is doing for the serial code and see what, therefore, it can do, is doing for your parallel code or what it's able to do for your parallel code. So, there's a bunch of different things that we have to care about. We have to care about numer and affinity later. We have to care about false sharing. We've got to actually worry about whether or not our transformations are going to be stopping the compiler doing a good job. We want to be worried about synchronization. All of these different things come into play. So, we've now got three exercises um, for you to look at. There's a mixture of some C, some Fortran, or C and Fortran, depending on which exercise it is, and it's a case of hunt the bug, okay, hunt the performance effect. In each case, I want you to find out what the performance effect uh, is that's slowing things down, so they're all going to be slowed down in parallel in some way, um, and then see if you can get around it. And in one case, there's not actually a real way around it, it's just understanding what is happening. So. Uh, you can, if you get the slides, you can actually try any of these three, but we'll, if you could do them in order, it'd be better because then we can go through together as what did we discover and how did things work. So the first one is a modified version of what we had before. These are in, by the way, the usual directory and in OpenMP perf, I think is the, under the tutorials. Um, and there are only four codes and one of them is, is just to have a C and a Fortran 90 version. And so this one's very much like we had on the first day, slightly w more data, so we can see effects a little bit better. And if you can use the GNU compiler, so we'll be specific on a compiler at the moment, just because it's something then I've actually made sure yesterday that it can go through the exercises again and it worked. Fingers crossed. And you can pick either a machine, though, for this. Uh, but I was using Pilatus. Yep. Um, 
Now I'm gonna jump ahead of Ben's talk. It's been something that he'll mention on one of his slides, but I need to give you an extra environment variable to, to run this on Pilatus uh, so you can actually get to see the performance and we don't get lost because these can be quite short runs. And that is, I need you to uh, export or set, set end. I'll write down export. K, M, P, affinity equals scatter. You can look up on the internet KMP affinity and see what this is, or you can wait to see Ben's slides. But this is basically to make sure that all your threads don't start to pile onto the same core, or even get too, do you get some consistency about when you do the different runs? So you in introduce this for do directive, and then as you increase the number of threads, do you get speed up? If so, how much? Or do you get a slow down? Just by putting the parallel four in the first thing. It's okay, it starts getting worse. Um, the sum value hopefully was the same in those cases. Um, then you can uh, move the parallel region outside of the loops, and you now need private J. Unfortunately, I was only realizing now that because of the way that I tried to make it easier so you always got 8,000 by flipping B backwards and forwards, um, you might not see the final, you might not see an error. Um, but if you did see an error, it would normally occur by well, actually, we do have the right number. It's about 8,000 points and three zeros and just some decimal noise. That would give you, tell you that the sum was incorrect. But that shouldn't really speed things up much at all, but it may do. And the reason, it, it, would, it may speed up things slightly, and that's because by moving the thing outside of the parallel, outside of the J loop, we now reduce the number of times we create and close the parallel region. Now, as I said, if you did this a few years ago, this would destroy your performance. But now it's just putting these things to sleep and bringing them back to life. Um, did you see a difference in timings by moving the parallel with the private J outside of the, the loop? Yes, no, sort of, maybe not, not quite sure, right. The final thing is then to put a no weight on and say, remove the synchronization from the inner loop. Does that improve performance? Okay. So that's the real thing that we're trying to get at here. It's synchronizations. Okay. Don't do too many synchronizations. Now, clearly, this is an artificial example doing whatever it happens to be, 100,000 iterations of synchronizations all the time. But it gives you an idea, even on small cases, of the synchronization overhead. And it's possible that you could hit that. So if you can see a way of putting no weight in your code through your do for loops and so on, um, also with single as well, which also has an implied weight instead of master, if particularly for the do loops, if you can get rid of the weights, you can get some better performance. And the, num the more threads that you add, the worse the synchronization overhead becomes because there's more threads that have got to synchronize. So one effect of scaling out is that actually this would hit you harder. So try and keep it to a minimum. Okay? Um, so the quasons are out there, and because it's now five minutes before we said we'd take the break, if we take the break now and then, or people who want to can just get on with the, the second exercise. This one's a little bit of a, of a a nice trick, and then the third exercise is the one that we really would also like to look at as well uh, before moving on to the affinity. This one you could probably go through quite quickly because, um, but it shows you a listing, um, and it's an interesting thing. It's the first time I think we've really used a Cray compiler apart from with Reveal. Anyway, coffee. And it's 
it's really bad when these things happen because sometimes you don't see them. Sometimes you don't see them for many minutes. Sometimes you might only see them for hours and so on. Uh, but they're there, sitting in the background. Sometimes they'll just give you completely different results each time. So, what on earth is a race condition? So, a race condition occurs when you've got two threads, or more threads, um, all wanting to update the same piece of data. So, it's related to what we'll look at in a second with, with cache coherency and thrashing and so on, but this time it's dangerous rather than a performance hit. And it's concerned with data when you load it into a processor register. Okay, once this data is in a register, nobody else can see it. Cache coherency is something where everybody is aware of everybody else's cache. If somebody else updates their cache, then I get a message to say my data is bad in my cache and therefore I should go and update it. When something's in a register, it's hidden from view. It's your own private little stash put in your wallet. Nobody else knows how many notes you've got there, but if you're at the cache point, they can see the notes coming out and so on. So this is um, rather bad. Now, one of the things about this is when we get a race condition, because we're mentioning here two threads. So, so far we've gone through and we've looked at vectorization and caches and threading, and we've seen some tools that might help you to actually develop threaded codes by doing, helping to do scoping and other things that we need if we want to be able to develop our codes effectively. Um, we're probably going to get through today quicker than on the timetable. One of the things we always get back from feedback forms and so on is that there's never enough time to finish the exercises and so on. So we want to make sure there's plenty of time for those exercises that you haven't finished later on in the day you'll be able to get on with. Today we're going to have a quick look at some of the more important things when you've got your code. Um, to make sure that you can get some good performance out of it. We'll just look at the bugs briefly, the, just mention briefly what those bug types are, um, and then we'll move on to performance issues. Um, so firstly, just to say what the most common types of bug are. Um, the first one would be incorrect scoping. So. If you declare your variable shared, private, and so on incorrectly, you're going to get a problem. Normally, these problems are quite repeatable and so on. You'll see them all the time. Um, and so, therefore, you can see that you've got a problem. Because we're doing this incrementally normally, we go through and we add an extra piece of parallelism to a code rather than just parallelizing huge sections, you know, thousands of lines at once before running and checking. You should be able to see if you've got a scoping problem as you're incrementally changing your code. So that may be one that you can easily spot. But be, be aware that when you're using tools such as Reveal, Intel Advisor, whatever it happens to be, particularly Reveal is the one we've shown, then that you check that actually when it says that something should be private, shared, whatever it happens to be, that it's actually you yourself believe that to be the case and understand why it's the case. So when we have a look at an exercise or two later, I've typically left out the parallel line so you can just fill in the scoping as well just to get, make sure you're doing it correctly. Um, so another bug that you sometimes see is when you change your algorithm from serial code, particularly if you're doing something with conditional compilation. So in Fortran, that's exclamation mark dollar. Um, as I said, I think it's a little ugly, but um, with C, it would be if def open MP. You may put some code in there. Oh, yes, this is just something I need for my code. But it may actually change the way that the, code, the algorithm works. Also, be aware that sometimes you get threaded numerical libraries. You've, you've brought in, create one, grab it for a particular thread, and then I'll release it at some point. And that lock will be there so that nobody else can get in. That could give you problems. In particular, it can give you problems with deadlock. This is not something you'd normally do in OpenMP. We haven't mentioned it here. We're not going to look at it here because it's something that you have to have a particular example you're interested in to do that way. But for other things, particularly pthreads, pthreads relies on it all the time. So effectively, OpenMP is relying on it all the time. It's just it's hidden from us. And this is where we have the mutex variables, condition variables. Mutex stands for mutual exclusion. Only one thread can have this at a time. If one of them grabs a lock and can't release it or doesn't release it, nobody else can move forward, you get deadlock. 
We don't need to worry about it too much, but if you go into a different threading model, be aware that that could be a problem. The one that's the real most important one for us, though, is a race condition. So this was mentioned by Jean-Guillaume yesterday, um, and there's one of the examples that you can use the debugging tool for to look at a race condition. Uh, it's the most common type of bug we get in threaded code. It's the most difficult to solve bug in threaded code. It's not restricted to OpenMP. This is in all threaded code from elsewhere. And there may be some slight differences in results. Occasionally, there's a bug, and there's actually a very different result. And then tell us or tell your vendor that you think that there's a problem. But oftentimes, um, it's just that there's some ordering, different ordering of the way that the operations are carried out, and it will give you some slight numerical difference. And that's like when we saw on the first day we were looking at um, the very contrived and simple example, and we had double precision and single precision, and people were saying the single precision results in, um, with vectorization were different. It's a similar sort of thing where threading, you may get things in a different order. The vectorization was also just doing things in a different order and giving a different result. Um, that's not necessarily a bug, it's just a different number. Ah, okay, we're getting closer to the full complement. Okay, um, now one thing that you probably won't see much of in an OpenMP code, unless you go out of your way to uh, put this in and therefore potentially introduce your own bugs, is deadlocks introduced from locking. That is, that you would typically use the runtime library routine um, you can see this from man pages or from the OpenMP standard in particular. You can see the, the library routine to say, okay, I want to lock, grab a lock, 